Well, good morning to you. So glad to see you this morning. Of course, here it is on Easter Sunday morning. And we're thrilled again that you've chosen to be with us here at Southwinds. We're so thankful for our faithful family here at Southwinds that comes and is in your place every Sunday. And for the visitors that are with us today, we're thrilled uh, again that you've chosen to celebrate uh, such a wonderful day with us here at, at our church. I uh, pray that you enjoy the day. Many of you are uh, probably here with some family and enjoying family time. We pray that you enjoy the day. Some of you are here uh, just out of respect for the Lord and have chosen our church. And as a visitor, we welcome you. We thank you for coming. And in the end, we're all here because of one reason, and that is that uh, the wonderful truth in all of history is that we have a Savior that is alive and well. That, uh, that certainly changes everything, doesn't it? It makes our worship worth it. It, it makes our, our reason for being in church uh, it makes it valuable to us, and uh, certainly to celebrate a God that is alive and well, and uh, the Bible tells us is uh, not just alive and well, but He is active, and has a plan, and is powerful, and has lots of love for those that uh, of this world that He loves so much, and has a plan for all of us, certainly, uh, that a great message in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll enjoy the day. I do hope that you... Um, Enjoy not just our time of worship, uh, certainly that's the key of our day, uh, to give God the rightful honor and, and praise that belongs to Him. We'll do that through the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes toward the end of our service. And uh, what, what a great day to remember not only what Christ has done for us, but the privilege He's left us to represent Him in this world in which we live. Amen. And we pray that you'll enjoy that with us as well. And I trust that I'll have some words for you that will be uh, encouraging to you. Uh, that will remind you again of the value of the day, uh, but there will also be uh, uh, maybe convicting in the sense that we want our God to have every part of our heart and life that He rightfully deserves. Amen. I pray that your commitment and your conviction for God will be good and sound and strong, and may the Lord be honored by that today. And again, we're so glad. It's Easter is an easy day for us to become excited about. Matter of fact, I was reflecting this morning on the 15th chapter of Corinthians. Matter of fact, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to that chapter. We're going to find uh, the first four verses will be our text for the message this morning. But it's in the 19th verse as the Lord is talking about this issue of resurrection. The Lord is talking through Paul as he begins to write under inspiration the scriptures there. In verse 19, Paul says this, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I want you to understand this morning, God does not want you to be miserable today. Amen. Misery is found in the fact that there's no hope for the future. That there seems to be no purpose or no direction, no destination, if you will. And, and Paul says, that if in this life only our lives are affected by whatever it is we do, and certainly for you and I, it's the issue of Jesus Christ, he says, if in this life we only have hope for Christ, then we are of all men most, most miserable. The fact is the resurrection took place. Amen. I was reflecting again this morning, how, how do you present Easter uh, in, in a, such a way that maybe we haven't heard it before? The answer to that is you don't. The fact is the message hasn't changed. Amen. And the message is always the same. Uh, every year that goes by. Uh, I was thinking this morning about... Um, you know, 2,015 years or so ago, the birth of our Savior, and, and of course now, really, the, the, the death of our Savior. And you stop and, you know, consider that. I'm so glad because the Bible says in Revelation 13, 8, that Jesus was the Lamb slain uh, before the foundation of the world. Well, I want you to know, I, I thank God for that, but I don't have any idea what that means. I don't really know what before the foundation of the world is like. You know, God, as an eternal God, whatever before when he said, let there be light, before that time, God had already determined on his infinite knowledge. He understood man's need and already had the solution, and he made that choice. The problem is, I can't identify with that. But there's one thing I'm so thankful God did, and in allowing his son to come to this earth and live in a human form and eventually die on the cross. Listen, we can mark that time. History allows us to put our fingers, if you will, to put our touch on that idea that in a time like today, can you imagine 
on that resurrection Sunday. Can you imagine processing everything that as the video showed Peter and John beginning to process what it means for the tomb to be empty. Can you imagine the, the fact is that God said now, right now, it is done and it is finished. Now in the end, 2,000 plus years later, we have the opportunity to open the Bible and open the scriptures. And by the way, that is such a privilege, amen. There are people in our world today that don't have the freedom necessarily to open the Bible like you and I do. And the fact is we can open the Bible, we read there in Colossians chapter 2, where the Bible says that the Lord triumphed over them, that is against principalities and powers, He triumphed openly over them, certainly as God said, now I have victory over death. There was a lot going on when the Lord stood up out of that tomb, amen. There has been a lot of activity going on in the spiritual world before our Lord put His feet back on the ground and stood up strong. There had been a lot of work take place. Hebrews says that our Savior went into the heavens and paid for sin. Amen. The Bible talks about how our Lord descended and led captivity captive, those believers, those souls, of which the Lord is the captain of their salvation. Amen. There's a lot going on in this issue of salvation. And the concept of resurrection, we have a, a way to say at that time, right then, right there, that's when it took place. That's when all of history focuses on such a moment in time. And I'm so thankful, just as I don't understand infinite time before creation, and just as much as my memory allows me to, but on the scripture, to lay hold of the truth of history in the scripture, and to know that on that day, on that day, our Lord resurrected. What a great day that makes this one, amen. What a great time that makes every Sunday. I mean, if you're a believer, every Sunday is a time of worship unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Matter of fact, it's more than just Sundays. We're going to find that here in the Lord's Supper in a few minutes, that in the concept of the Lord's Supper, we are saying that every day I will die to self and I will live unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great time, great time to celebrate. And I hope you enjoy the day. By the way, uh, I hope you have some uh, Easter egg hunts with your kids. But we all understand that Easter is not about Easter egg hunts. Amen. Amen. Hope you find the egg with all the money. Hope you find the egg with the best chocolates in them. Amen. And by, by the way, if you find one of those, I, I just so you'll know, I love Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. By the way, anybody else with me on that one? Reese's Peanut Butter Cups? Anybody else on that? That's what I thought. Yeah. That's good stuff. Hope you enjoy the day. Enjoy the, the family time. And uh, may the Lord get all the glory in what we're doing. Well, I want to focus from the first four verses of Corinthians 15. I want to focus our thoughts on the, the, the here as it contains in the gospel. There in those first four verses, Paul declares what the gospel really is about. Look there, verse 1. As he writes unto the Corinthian believers, he says, Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. By the way, make the connection there. The gospel leads you to salvation. Amen. Salvation is based on the issues of the gospel. Connect that. I preached unto you the gospel, verse 1, verse 2, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Connect another dot. The gospel leads you to salvation, and salvation is based on belief. What you believe about Jesus Christ answers the question for all eternity about your sin and about your eternity. Amen. So the gospel contains the message that brings us to the issues of salvation. And salvation is based on what you believe about Jesus Christ. Verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. By the way, did you capture in verse 3 and 4, both verses end with the phrase, according to the Scriptures. By the way, let's connect plenty of dots here. We love drawing pictures with connected dots. God said, through Paul, and I, I preached unto you the gospel, and this gospel is the message by which salvation is contained. And this salvation message demands that what you believe about Jesus Christ is the only way 
to be saved. And oh, by the way, the message is contained in the Scriptures. It's according to the Scriptures by which this gospel message has come forth. Now Paul said, I delivered to you what was delivered unto me. By the way, there's another great dot in the picture of the gospel. God said, I, now Paul, here's your message, and I want you to tell the whole world about it. Amen. And then Paul said, now, now I've given it to you. The question is, what are you going to do with it? The question is, what are you going to do with the great message of Jesus Christ? Because in that message, 2,000 plus years later, guess what? We're still talking about it. Amen. We're still talking about what was delivered by God through the great apostles in the Word of God that's been handed down through the centuries that here today we still talk about the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and of course the resurrection. Amen. Romans chapter 10 tells us, that if a man will confess with his mouth and believe in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, there's one marked difference between Jesus Christ and his death and every other death that's ever taken place on the earth. That is this, that Jesus Christ, first of all, was perfect. He had no sin, amen. And that in his death, he resurrected in a perfect condition, in a perfect state, and he indeed become, has become and is the Savior of the world. Trust me, if I died today, it wouldn't do you any good for eternity. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you died for me, I'm not feeling good about that. Praise the Lord. The fact is that that death of Christ, based on his resurrection, his resurrection into a perfect state, now the Bible tells us he is seating, uh, seated, sitting, seated, satted at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Amen. I'll have to edit the tape on that one. Amen. Now concerning this gospel message, it's really simple. It's really simple. The Bible tells us that in all of this story, there, there's one truth that underlies uh, the, the gospel message, that there's one active agent that's effective in all the story. It's not only the love of God, it's not only the work of Christ, but I would say it's the part of the Holy Spirit that he plays in the role of the gospel. You see, men today, as they hear the message, trust me, folks, Trust me, men don't get saved because Andy chews talking about the gospel. Men get saved because in the words of humanity, in the human words that men put together, the Spirit of God then takes those words in conjunction with the power of the Scriptures and He conveys them into the hearts and minds of people who yet know Christ. And in the message and the power of the Spirit of God, with the gospel of Christ, men hear an incredible, important truth that they need to be saved. Now, the work of the Holy Spirit we find not just in our life, it's not just an activity that He's doing with, with people on the earth today, we find His activity involved in the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our theme for the year is by His Spirit. We're discovering throughout the year how active and how much work that the Holy Spirit is putting into the, the, the work of God, into the plan of God, into the lives of people, and certainly through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our theme comes from the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, the fourth chapter in the sixth verse. And in that particular passage, j just a quick uh, setup for our message this morning, he tells Zechariah that all of the work that I'm going to ask you to do, in all of the effort that you could ever give forth in life, in all of this plan of God that you are such an instrument by which God accomplishes his things to be done, in all of this there's one truth that it will only be accomplished by the Spirit of God working in and through you. Now that truth is still evident today for you and I. Folks, you don't get saved without the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The gospel is really not preached unless the Spirit of God takes that truth and permeates the hearts and minds of men. Amen. And the work of the Spirit of God is still active uh, throughout our world today. The truth is that the Spirit of God was there at the formation of the, of the worlds, Genesis chapter 1, and he'll be there at the end of time, Revelation 22. He is still active and still at work, and we see the activity and the part that the Holy Spirit plays. I would tell you this morning, he's here talking to you right now. He's here helping communicate to you the truths of God's Word. He wants you to understand the truth of the Gospel. He wants you to understand the significance of the life of Christ 
the, the, the death and the burial and, and the resurrection of Christ. He wants you to hear that. He wants you to hear that whether you're lost or saved. If you're lost this morning, please understand, God loves you enough that in the plan of the gospel, He has a way to take all of your sin and erase it for all of eternity. Amen. That wonderful message is still for you today if you're not saved. But I'm going to tell you, it's for believers as well. Those of us that are saved, those of us who have come to Christ already in belief, just as Corinthians 15 points out, if you've come to Christ and you are saved this morning, please understand, God doesn't want you to forget the involvement of the Holy Spirit of God with the gospel for you as well. Let's remind ourselves, for those of you that are saved, that the gospel still needs to be preached and God wants us to do it. Amen. The gospel is still the content of our Christianity. It's still the content of the message of all of Christianity. By the way, let's make it very clear. Christianity at its very core is the truth that there's a message that needs to be worldwide and it's absolutely world-changing. And it's found in Jesus Christ. Amen. By the way, not everybody agrees with that. Not everybody accepts that. And that's okay. It's okay in this sense that we're not trying to be combative, amen. We're not trying to insult. That's not our point. The point is this, we believe about the Bible and what the Bible declares about the gospel message and we believe that it's a world-changing message, amen. And in the end, you and I as believers are still to be talking about it. We're still to be believing it. We're still to be celebrating it. We're still to be worshiping the God who planned it. And in the end, that what's make, that's what makes our Christianity uh, so valuable and so worth it for the Lord. And the work of the Spirit, and by His Spirit, we have the gospel. It's by the Spirit of God that we have this wonderful message uh, that we talk about so, so clearly and so often. And we see the, the involvement and the activity of the Spirit of God uh, in, in terms of the, the, the life of Jesus Christ and the issues of His death and His burial and His resurrection. The beautiful truth we find in the Scripture is that the entire life of Jesus Christ was for the purpose of loving and saving us. What a beautiful message. And the fact is that really there is no death there is no burial and there is no resurrection without first our wonderful and perfect Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being born. The birth of Christ, oh the birth of Christ. Oh, oh, that, uh, by the way, I'm kind of glad that we kind of separate the birth of Christ and the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ because we get too hot today. Amen. We get time off work, Amen. We get, uh, by the way, uh, I'm looking for that, that peanut, Reese's peanut butter cup bunny here in a little bit. Amen. I'm so thankful at Christmas time. We, we celebrate with the giving and, and, and receiving of gifts. By the way, don't never forget Christmas. The Lord said himself, it's better to give than to, listen, Christmas is not about getting. Christmas is really about giving. Is that right? But the fact is, you really can't separate the birth of Christ and the death of Christ. We really, it's really impossible to separate the issues of our Savior's birth from the issues of our Savior's death and resurrection because in the end, it's the same story. I mean, in the end, it's the same point that in God's plan was to send His Son to the earth that He might be born of a virgin, that in the end, He might give His life willingly on the cross of Calvary. Well, when you find the activity of the Spirit, the Bible says and the activity of the Spirit concerning in His birth. By His Spirit in birth is the point, point number one. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, but while He thought on these things, this is Joseph as he's processing the fact and the reality that his fiancée Mary is now impregnated with a child. He's trying to grapple and understand and wrap his mind around the fact that his fiancée is pregnant. And while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine the reality and in trying to embrace the message and the story of having a woman who's never known a man to come up pregnant? The Bible 
tells us of this miraculous story of which the human mind really it's incomprehensible we really don't understand that because we only understand the human realities of how life comes forth but God tells us in the book of Luke in chapter 1 verse 30 and the angel said unto her fear not Mary for thou hast found favor with God and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. The Bible speaks of the Spirit of God overshadowing her. He shall overshadow thee. The Bible uses the word conceive in our English language. It uses it in both verses. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Also in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31. Two different Greek words though. The first conceive in Matthew 1 21 simply means to procreate or to be born or to have child. But in Luke chapter 1, it gives us more an insight into the work of the Holy Spirit because there it means to clasp or to seize. It's as if the Spirit of God looked into the womb of Mary, a virgin, and said, now here, the great creator of all the worlds in which we live now is going to seize your womb and create something here. Oh, the great creator, by the way, who can simply utter a word and have the sun hang in the universe. The same God can reach into a man's life and seize whatever he chooses to seize and create life. Amen. And God tells us this Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you and you are going to conceive. I don't know there's a greater truth in life than realizing that um, you're going to have a child. Matter of fact, just last night, my son Dallas asked me, he said, uh, Dad, when when mom came and told you that she was going to have a child, your, our first child, Taylor, he said, when mom told you you were going to have a child, what was that like? And I said, well, oh my. You know, the first thought is, what? You know, what? We're going to have a what? <laughs> and then the, 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 the emotions are cool. That's awesome. You know, we're going to have a kid. Oh, no. <laughs> we're going to have a kid. What does that mean? Are they going to eat? You know, are they, are they going to use the, the restroom? <laughs> you know, we got to buy diapers. I'm not changing diapers. I'm sorry. I'm just not doing that. Amen. All the emotions that go with this concept of having a child. And I remember that day when Taylor was born, that, that moment when she arrived into this world. I remember as a young father, just overwhelmed. How do you process all that? I mean, how do we take all that in? By the way, don't let anybody tell you you can ever prepare for that moment. If they say you can be prepared for that, they're lying through their teeth. Amen. Can you imagine hearing the story, God? The Holy Ghost is going to clasp or seize your womb and take part in your womb to create life. And this child is going to be not just any child. This child is going to be the Son of God. Now listen, folks, you and I know, even though this is not Christmas, the reality is that at Easter time there is no death, there is no burial, and there is no resurrection without first God conceiving in Mary the wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. The fact is the Spirit of God, as he has worked in the gospel in the birth of Christ, he was active and, and well working within a great story of the birth of Christ. How, how about then, if we take that story a little further on, you, you read through the life of Christ. You read through the Gospels, you read through the book of Luke in chapter 2 there, and you read through uh, the book of Mark, and you read through, boy, John and Matthew as well. You read about this life of Christ, these 30 plus years that our Lord walked on this earth. You begin to discover several things about the Spirit of God. He, he does, wasn't just there when he conceived in Mary, but he was also there in the life of Christ. The Bible talks about anointing our Savior. The Bible says there in Matthew chapter 3 that at his baptism that the Holy Spirit anointed our Savior the, as the dove descending from the heavens and lighting upon the Son of God. Then the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 that the anointing was by the Holy Ghost. 
The Holy Ghost is the significant symbol of God's anointing upon Jesus Christ. By the way, the Bible declares... The Bible declares that if a spirit denies that Jesus is the Savior, listen, that is the spirit of Antichrist. But every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, listen to me, you know why we acknowledge Him as the Christ? Because the Holy Spirit of God anointed Him as the Savior. Amen. Oh, the anointing of the Spirit. The Spirit of God saying, this is the one. This is the one. The anointing of the Spirit moved into the leading of the Spirit. Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4 talks about how the Spirit now, as He works with our Savior to lead and guide Him, our Savior in human form, having some limitations in His earthly life, now having been led of the Spirit of God. I imagine there in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, I love the passage where the Lord I believe, led of the Holy Spirit, enters into the synagogue and into the temple, and he grabs the book of Isaiah right out of the priest's hand. He opens the Bible to the book of Isaiah, and he begins to read. There will be one coming, setting the captives free. Amen. Bringing deliverance, giving sight to the blind. And he reads the book of Isaiah and he closes the book, the Bible says. And the Lord looks out onto the crowds in the synagogue that day and he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled, for I am he. Can you imagine the moment when having been led by the Spirit of God and anointed by the Spirit of God to move into the temple and declare to all the world, I'm the Savior. I'm the one you're looking for. Not a prideful moment. Matter of fact, it's a culmination of the plan of God because He has coming in human form. He came eventually to die as the Savior of the world, having been anointed and led by the Spirit of God to declare, I am the Savior. This day is the Scripture fulfilled. The Bible talks about the Spirit of God empowering Him. Luke chapter 4 and verse 14 talks about the Spirit of God having uh, empowered our Savior for service. Oh, the anointing, the leading of the Spirit, the empowering of the Spirit. Listen, the work of the Spirit, by His Spirit, our Savior was born, our Savior lived, and we come to another thought, and that is simply this, our Savior died. Our Savior died. I wasn't there at Calvary. I, I don't, I've tried to imagine through the years what it must have been like to be a Calvary. I can't imagine the sorrow and the pain. I can't imagine ju just the, the empty feeling of realizing I, the, the, the Bible describes the apostles, the disciples feeling in their heart the sorrow of losing their Savior. The Bible describes that they were they're gathered in the room after his death, the day of the resurrection. They were gathered there for fear of the Jews. They had kind of lost their purpose. They seemingly had lost their, the glue that held them together. They had lost the glue of their faith. Even Thomas that night said, I will not believe that he is resurrected unless I can put my finger in his hands and my hand in his side. Oh, the glue of faith that came through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day when our Savior willingly gave his life. The Bible declares to us in the book of Hebrews of all places, you might think it might be in the Gospels. But it's in the book of Hebrews where we find the true content of the gospel message. All the activity of our spirit, uh, of our Savior, empowered by the Spirit of God to do the work that needed to be done. Here's Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. That's Old Testament ceremonial ritual worship law. Offering bulls and goats and heifers for a sacrifice of blood. He then asked the question, how much more shall the blood of Christ, listen to this, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Can I ask you a question this morning? 
if our Savior, if our, if our Spirit rather, was there at the birth of Christ, if the Spirit of God was there in the life of Christ, and we come to the reality of by His Spirit at His death, the Bible says that our Savior went to the cross through the eternal Spirit. Our Spirit certainly sustained and supported and strengthened our Savior throughout His life. And there on the cross, the Lord, the Bible declares, no man took our Savior's life. No man took our Savior's life. We see in, a, in, a, in, in some sense the humanity of our Savior there in the garden as He prays, Lord, if it be Thy will, take this cup from me. Guess what? That wasn't the will of the Father. But what we find in our Lord's humanity is the strength and support and empowerment of the Spirit of God. They say, no, let's go together. Let, let, let's go to the cross. Please understand, the redemption of salvation is in the blood of Christ, but our Spirit helped him offer himself. Amen. Our Spirit was there. By his Spirit at birth, by his Spirit in life, by his Spirit in death, we come to the reality that three days later, after offering himself in death, by the way, there's a lot of people who don't believe in a literal three days in the grave. Listen to me, the Bible declares he was three days and three nights in the tomb. And the Bible then declares that early that morning when the women went to the tomb to seek and to anoint the body for burial, the Bible says they found the stone rolled away. Matter of fact, on the way to the tomb that morning, we find the women having a discussion amongst themselves. And here's the question that they're, they're, they're bantering back and forth. Here's the question. Who's going to roll the stone away? Mark 16, you can read it for yourself. Who's going to roll the stone away? I imagine Mary and Martha and others that were there. I mean, they're looking at each other. Now, now I, I, I'm a frail person. You've got to do it. I don't have the strength to roll that stone away. I don't think all you know, three or four of us together can combine our strength and roll that giant stone from in front of the tomb. How are we going to get into the tomb? Listen, here's the beauty of it. It's not you getting into the tomb. It's the Savior getting out. Amen. The Bible says they were there when they got there that morning before the sun rose. The tomb, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Matter of fact, we saw the video a while ago, Peter and John the women went back, told Peter and John, the tomb is empty. John takes off. Peter takes off. I love the Bible. By the way, God's got a sense of humor. Peter must have been a good Baptist preacher because the Bible says John outran him. John got to the tomb just as the video to portray. That's that biblically accurate. John and his fleet-footedness, he was a young man, ran to the tomb, but he runs to the door, and he's peeking in the door. Oh, Peter... Not only probably he's a heavy set Baptist preacher, but his brakes aren't that good either. The Bible says he runs right into the tomb. Didn't stop at all. Runs right into the tomb. Says, hey, guess what? He ain't here. What do you think about that, John? The Bible says he brings out the clothing, the grave clothing, wrapped and folded. Listen, the Jewish culture, the wrapped and folded burial clothes, often when they would eat, if they would fold their napkin, it was a sign they weren't done yet. They were coming back. Listen, the Lord folded his burial clothes. It's a symbol of our Savior telling us, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And the resurrection of our Savior, the Bible declares that in this great story of the resurrection of our Savior, by the way, this morning, I woke up out of sleep this morning pretty early. And it's funny, you know, Easter's a, Easter's a hard day for me to get excited about. I woke up, boy, my eyes popped open. I was wide awake. About 5.45 this morning. Jumped out of bed, sat there for a moment. It was still dark outside. And my mind instantly went. I wonder what the women were thinking on that way to the tomb. I know what they were thinking. Who's going to roll stone away? Early that morning, the earthquake, the angel of the Lord, men falling down as if they were dead, the soldiers, and the reality is our Savior is resurrected. A celebration of a living and well Savior of the world. Now the Bible says in all that story, the Bible declares that it's in the resurrection of the Savior that which we must believe in order to be saved. But the Bible declares as well that the Spirit was active in the resurrection of the Savior. Listen to the Scriptures. 
This comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, listen to this now, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. Being quickened by the Spirit of God. Can you imagine how God in all of his intricacies and in all of his wisdom and in his incredible plan of which we struggle to comprehend in all of the activity that God, the Father, says to God, the Spirit, now's the time. Now's the time. Let's, let's breathe life back into our son. Let, let, let's bring life back from the tomb. Let, let, let's put life back in to the lungs of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand one simple truth. Though our Savior's body is laying dormant in the tomb, listen, our Savior is not dead. Our Savior is working and active. You read Ephesians chapter 4, read Hebrews chapter 9, read 1 Peter chapter 3, read 1 Corinthians 15, read what the Bible says about the work and the activity of Jesus Christ while His body is dormant. Our Savior is conquering death and the victory of our Savior. Read Colossians chapter 2. Read Ephesians chapter 6. Re read all the Bible because the Bible declares that in the scriptures and the, the declaration of God that our Savior resurrected from the dead. That our Savior was active in saving the world. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 that he descended into the earth. Hebrews 9 says that he ascended into the tabernacle which is in the heavens. They are taking his precious and pure blood that 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about, taking the precious and pure blood of Jesus Christ, and there in the heavenly tabernacles, a tabernacle not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, offering his blood on the mercy seat for all of the world. And God declares it's a one-time deal. It's a one-time sacrifice. Our Savior, while His body lay dormant, our Savior is in the heavens pouring His blood on the mercy seat. God the Father, as Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it's an odor and a sweet smell of an offering that's pleasing unto God. Our God in heaven is propitiated. He's satisfied and, and, and happy with the sacrifice of the blood of Christ there upon the mercy seat. And our Savior provided salvation. Listen to me, here's the point. In all the activity of our Savior, He is alive and well and doing the work of the Savior while His body lay dormant in a tomb three days and three nights. And God the Father in Peter 3.18 says, Now, as He offered His flesh in death for sin once, now He is made alive by the Spirit of God. By the way, go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. The Lord says, And Adam, as he lay there in a lump of clay, he breathed into him the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul. Listen to me. God, in the bodily form of our Savior Jesus Christ, through the Spirit of God, breathed life back into our Savior. And our Savior stood up on his physical feet again. Amen. And our Savior took off his grave clothes. By the way, there's such incredible parallels. Remember when Lazarus was resurrected by our Savior? John chapter 11. The Lord, as he resurrects Lazarus, says to Lazarus in the tomb, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible declares that Lazarus still had the grave clothes on him. Can't see, can't move, can't touch anything, barely waddling around like a, like a dead man now living. And the Lord says in John 11, 44, Take the clothes off of him. Take the grave clothes because he's alive. Listen, here's the truth. Nobody took the clothes off our Savior. He did it himself. And he did it with the help of the Spirit of God. God breathed life back into our Savior. By his Spirit, he was born. By his Spirit, he died. And by the Spirit, he lives. And I would tell you this morning, I would tell you this morning, Say, Brother Andy, what in the world's all that got to do with me? I'm really glad you asked. Here's the truth. By His Spirit, you were born again. 
The Bible declares in John chapter 3, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot see or enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen to me, men are not entering into heaven because of anything they can do themselves. The Bible declares it is not of works. There's not any amount of good things you can do to enter into heaven. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough resources. You don't have enough will. You don't have enough intentions. Amen. The Bible declares it is not of works, but you are born again of the Spirit. Listen, if you want to be saved, there's only one way to be saved. That is to be led of the Spirit to the cross of Christ and accept what Christ has already done for you and believe upon Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I would tell you this. It's by His Spirit that you die. For those of us that are saved, the issue of dying is really not a scary thing. By the way, just a word of announcement to our church. Just yesterday afternoon, Miss Joan Adams went on home to be with the Lord. Miss Joan had had some serious health uh, struggles the last year or two, and yesterday had a chance to visit with her just for a few minutes, and we knew it was near time. About 3.30 yesterday afternoon, she went on home to be with the Lord. By the way, what a great Sunday to be in church, or in, what a great day to be in heaven for the first time. Can you imagine being in heaven on Easter Sunday? By the way, she's in a better place than we are. But here's the point. See, for those of us that know God and those of us that are saved, by His Spirit to die, death is not a scary thing because death ushers us into the presence of God Himself. Amen. Amen. But here's the truth. There's another issue of death for you believers. The Bible says in Corinthians 15, Paul said, I die daily. There's only one way for you to die daily, and it's by His Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit and surrender yourself to the control of of Almighty God through the Spirit of God. There's one quick point for you that may be lost this morning about death. The Bible declares this. Please hear this this morning. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. Can I remind you this morning that the Bible message is simply this, that there is sin in your life, that the penalty for that is eternity separated from God and God declares if you're not saved this morning you will suffer the consequences of death it will be eternity without God and I want you to understand this morning if your life is required of you today you will suffer for the rest of eternity because of your sin the gospel message is though you don't have to die to to, to yourself or to your sin you can believe in Jesus Christ amen the final quick thought is simply this by His Spirit in birth, by His Spirit in death, and by His Spirit in resurrection. Not only do you die to self, because there's some of this mentality that if I surrender to God and die to self, then my life is over. I'll, I'll not be happy. I'll not be fulfilled. I'll not have a purpose in life. I want to tell you, it couldn't be further from the truth. Because God said, by my spirit are you born again. By my spirit do you die to self. But it's by my spirit of which you are resurrected and enjoy the resurrected daily Christian life that God has planned for you. John chapter 10, the Lord said, I come to give them life. But not just life, I came to give them abundant life. The abundant, blessed Christian life. The resurrected Christian life to be lived every day by his spirit. For those of you Christians who are lacking purpose, then I would tell you, experience death and resurrection at the hands of the Spirit of God. And find your purpose again. Find your direction in life. So I just don't have any direction, Pastor Andy. I don't know what life is about. I don't know why I'm here. I have no reason to do what I'm doing. Listen, that is found in the resurrected Christian life at the hands of the Spirit of God. Amen. And in the end, by His Spirit, for our Savior to be born, to live, to die, and to live again. And by His Spirit, in the lives of people, we would experience birth in salvation, death in surrender, and resurrection in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. So I wonder this morning, what about you? Are you living life by His Spirit? 
Are you saved? Have you come to Christ in salvation? I can tell you one simple truth. The Lord says again, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. The word confess simply means to agree in the Bible. Will you agree that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? Are you still struggling to come to the conclusion that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, paid the price for the sins of the world, even your own? Are you still struggling to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ? I would say to you this morning, come and acknowledge Him. The Bible says again, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. The wonderful truth is, Capture this now. The wonderful truth is this, that the gospel is simple. It is simple. But in the end, it has to be genuine. Amen? Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For you believer, I wonder, I wonder for you believers, will you experience the death and the resurrection by His Spirit? We're going to observe the Lord's Supper here in just a couple of moments. We're going to enjoy remembering our Savior's death. For for the juice represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And and, and the wafer represents the, the body of our Savior. Please understand, our Savior gave His life not just to secure your eternity, but to secure your today, your presence for today. So in the end, will you acknowledge And will you surrender? And will you live a resurrected life unto the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word. Father, thank you for Easter Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for the day when you've marked it down in history for us that we might remember the beautiful day of the resurrection of our Lord. Father, thank you for giving us or the privilege of celebrating. Thank you for the privilege of demonstrating, Lord, our surrender and our living. Father, I pray that you'll be with those here today who may not be saved. Father, I pray that you'd confront them. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them. Lord, I pray that in their heart, Lord, they might engage you. Father, they might believe and confess and be saved. And Father, I certainly pray for those who claim you as Savior. Father, may it be by your Spirit in which we exist. Father, we love you now. Lord, I pray that you'll have your will away in every heart and life. And we ask it in Jesus' name.